All right. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the latest Green Bank Science Lunch Talk. Um, today, we have uh, our very own postdoc, Pedro Salas, who will be giving us an update on the progress of LASI. So, Pedro, when you're ready, take it away. Thank you, Jesse. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Pedro, a postdoc here at the observatory. And my main functional responsibility here is to work on this project called the Laser Antenna Surface Scanning Instrument, or LASI for short. And today I will like to share with you where the project stands, what are the latest results we have obtained, and uh, just briefly touch on some of the things we still need to do. Um, before getting started, I just wanted to highlight the very nice logo that Paul Bostin designed for us. And also uh, just give a shout out to all of the staff at the observatory for their great work that has made progress on this project possible even during these uh, this crazy times. So as an overview of what I will be talking about, I will start uh, with a, an introduction, uh, giving a small motivation of why we want to uh, build an instrument such like such as the LASIC. Then I will describe the instrument. Uh, what is it? How does it work? And give some of its characteristics. And then I'll jump into the results we have obtained uh, during testing and commissioning of the instrument. Then I'll briefly talk about the things we still need to do and end up with a summary. And the short answer to the title of the talk is, well, the LASI, at least the, the hardware, is installed already on the telescope, as you can see here in this very nice GIF by Lucy Finuca. So as a motivation for uh, trying to increase the number of available hours at, uh, for three millimeter observations, we have that uh, observations at these uh, wavelengths uh, offer key insights into different uh, scientific topics, such as planet and star formation, astrochemistry, galaxy evolution and cosmology. And particularly doing this kind of observations with a large telescope, such as the GVT, uh, offers the opportunity to map large areas uh, quite efficiently. So it is something that we want to, to pursue for these reasons. Some science examples of the things you can do using the GVT at three millimeters. We have uh, very long baseline interferometry, here I'm showing an example of the jet of M87 observed with the, with the BLBI using the GVT at a microsecond resolution. You can also study the San, San Seldo. You can measure the San Seldo effect using a resource such as Mustang. And if you're interested, you can check out the work by Charles Romero and Emily Moravec. You can also do observations of molecular gas uh, using resources such as Argos or you can study uh, continuum emission uh, from galactic sources. And here I'm highlighting uh, Im an image from the galactic plane, particularly the galactic center, as observed with the most time receiver at 90 gigahertz. So there are plenty of reasons to want to have more time available for, for three millimeter observations. How can you, how come like, uh, that a telescope as big as the GVT can actually do these kind of observations? Well, the short answer is that it's thanks to the fact that it has this active surface on its primary reflector. So the primary reflector is composed of roughly 2000 panels. And on the corner of each one of these panels, we have one of these actuators, which enables the positioning of the panels with a precision of micrometers. So thanks to this, uh, were able to keep the surface error of the telescope around 230 microns. Besides the active surface, there are a number of other corrections that are being applied behind the scenes and some others not so behind the scenes. And I'm not gonna go into detail into this, but when you take all the corrections into account and the improvements that the staff has done throughout the years and also uh, some 
right minds that have come and participated in the development of the GBT, you end up with something like this, where we're showing the relative efficiency at 43 gigahertz as a function of elevation, as a function of different years. So you can see that when we when uh, close to the commissioning of the GVD, the efficiency was very elevation dependent. But as time went by and uh, improved models came online, this began to flatten to a point we are now here in 2014, uh, shown with this green line, where you see that the elevation is, uh, sorry, that the efficiency is almost independent of elevation or uh, at almost any elevation. So what does this mean? It means that once you are able to correct the surface so that its error is around 230 microns, you can then go and observe at other elevation and the surface uh, accuracy will remain uh, practically the same. And uh, also I should mention that the method that's currently used to bring the surface accuracy to this level is called out of focus holography where you basically map the surface sorry you map the beam of the telescope in and out of focus and from that uh, work back to get uh, what the deformations of the primary reflector look like um, if we don't apply uh, any corrections for thermal offsets we do get a pretty good surface uh, rms roughly 300 microns the exact value will depend on the uh, weather conditions and how close these are to when the models uh, have been derived, in particular the, the gravity Cernike model. Um, and this figure is just showing that uh, from observations with Mustang, we work back to get the surface RMS uh, during a span of roughly 20 minutes without applying any corrections for thermal deformation so this is just applying the Cernike gravity model and the rest of the corrections in the previous slide and you get a pretty decent uh, surface RMS. The dotted black line here at the bottom shows what you can do when you apply the thermal corrections uh, under excellent weather conditions. And here on the bottom we have the temperature of the at different points on the structure of the telescope, particularly at the ground and on the surface of the primary reflector during the same time. This is just showing that as long as the temperature remains relatively stable, uh, this works uh, very well. Now, if the temperature begins to change, of course the whole structure will change and this will introduce the formations into the surface of the primary reflector. And this is what we're showing here, the surface error as a function of time after sunrise for observations carried out during the winter and during the summer. That's why the red points and the blue points are uh, so different. And with it, what this is showing basically is that you can get away uh, with a, if you corrected your surface during the night and you go into sunrise, you can get away for something like 40 minutes, maybe an hour after sunrise, your uh, surface error is going to remain relatively low. But as the temperature begins to change, then the surface error will also uh, begin to, to increase. Um, and practically, this means that if you wanted to observe during the day, particularly during these times when the temperature is changing uh, actively, um, you need to spend a good time, uh, a good fraction of your time uh, doing this kind of calibrations. The current method, uh, autofocus holography, takes uh, somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes to, to complete. Um, so that means that if you need to correct for these things every hour or so, you would spend basically something like uh, half of the time just deriving corrections, leaving little time for science. And that is one of the main motivations for uh, investigating the use of the LASI. Because using the terrestrial laser scanner, we should be able to uh, measure these deformations uh, uh, faster so that then we could leave more time for science. So why is this uh, thing uh, that uh, we call the LASI? Well, it's basically a, a commercial off-the-shelf 
terrestrial laser scanner uh, shown here on the bottom. That's a Leica scan station P50. And what this does is basically rotate around its base and with a spinning mirror. And from uh, while it's doing this, it shoots out a laser, which then bounces back and uh, uh, we get a measurement of the distance as a function of position and what we call a point cloud. <clears throat> it is installed close to the focus of the telescope shown here uh, in its, uh, once it was installed. And from there, it can scan the surface of the primary reflector at almost any elevation. Well, at any elevation, basically. Thanks to uh, this hinge here that allows it to free float uh, as the telescope moves. Um, this is where it's installed in a side view of the telescope. It's uh, the beam extends from the top of the receiver cabin and the instrument is hanging upside down because it needs to operate within plus or minus 10 degrees from its gravity vector. And in the mode we use it currently, it has a, a, range, a maximum range of 200 meters. So it can see the primary reflector uh, remarkably, remarkably well. Also uh, some other parts of the structure such as the ground or the feeder. And this is uh, two examples of how the dish looks like as seen by the instrument at two different elevations, where you can see that there's nothing obstructing the view of the primary reflector uh, at these two elevations. In terms of the characteristics of the instrument, well, if we just take the measurements of the scanner and, and we measure repeatedly a point at a fixed distance, we see that uh, the uncertainty in the distance we're measure, measuring, the range uncertainty is roughly half a millimeter uh, at 50 meters, shown here on the bottom left, where we're plotting basically this uh, range uncertainty as a function of distance from the, uh, from the scanner. And uh, this increases with distance uh, just because the, the mainly because the intensity of the return laser decreases with uh, with distance and that this increases the range uncertainty. And besides this uh, stochastic uncertainty in the measurements, there's also a systematic, uh, there are also systematic effects because the instrument is not really built to measure uh, things at micrometer precision, uh, but mainly for surveying purposes. Uh, its optics are not uh, aligned to this level of precision. And this produces this pattern that we're seeing here on this scan of the primary reflector of the GVD. So this is just showing uh, the uh, offsets uh, in meters with respect to a vertex of the GVD. And what we see here, it's the, the surface of the, of the GVD after we subtract uh, uh, a paraboloid from it. And we see that we're still left with this uh, very funky looking uh, pattern. That's just the signature of the scanner. That's not that the, that the reflector actually looks like this. As we saw before, the surface RMS is roughly 300 microns. And here we're talking about uh, variations of roughly 40 millimeters. So this is uh, definitely not the, the reflector of the GVD. It's just the signature of the scanner. Um, so the scanner delivers a point cloud. And as we see, it's uh, imperfect. So we do a couple of things with this point cloud so that we can perform uh, the deformation analysis we're interested in. The first step is to reduce the volume uh, of the data so that we can do the analysis faster. And this is done in uh, uh, well, this is done in two steps basically. We start from the raw point cloud where we have pieces of the feed arm, the ground, the receiver cabin. And we select only those points that uh, are on the surface of the primary reflector. Uh, once we have our dish, we smooth the data using a Gaussian kernel to reduce the volume of points while keeping, uh, while keeping uh, as much information as possible. And this reduces the, the number of data points by roughly a factor of, uh, I forget exactly now, but uh, it's roughly a factor of uh, 100. Once we have our smoothed uh, point clouds, we register them to a common reference frame. And then to reduce the effects of the systematics from the scanner, 
we take the difference between scans to see how the diff how the surface has changed relative uh, relatively between these two scans. So here on the top, I'm showing two scans after subtracting the parabola and uh, doing some other corrections to the data. And you can see that you still uh, are left with this uh, weird pattern. Looks a bit like an eye on the on the dish. This is again just the signature of the scanner plus the processing. Um, but as soon as we take the difference between them, we see that the surface is revealed. And in this particular case, we have this clover leaf-like pattern because that was the deformation we were introducing to the surface uh, using the active surface. So if, if we hadn't introduced any, any deformations, this would look basically flat and we would only see the, the noise because of the scanner, of the range uncertainty of the scanner. Once we have this uh, map uh, made from the difference between the uh, what we call a signal and a reference scans, we end up uh, we fit the Cernigi polynomials to a surface, and that's the end product of the LASI uh, corrections to the that can be sent to the active surface by the users, in, uh, expressed as uh, Cernigi polynomials. And this is an example of how these corrections look like. And in this particular case, we have two bars, uh, the red ones that represent what was commanded to the active surface, and the blue ones that represent what we were measuring with the LASI. So we can see that we can measure some, uh, some polynomials uh, well, some others not so, not so well. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, in terms of the time it takes to do all of this, each scan takes roughly six minutes from when you hit go to when you get your end result. And if you, because we need to use a reference and a signal scan to take the difference, this is a total of 12 minutes to get the thermal Cernicky offsets. By comparison, like I was, uh, like I said before, uh, out of focus holography takes roughly 10 to 30 minutes depending on the receiver. And uh, of course, one of the advantages of using the LASI is that you can do this at any elevation, so you don't need to spend extra time slewing. So um, I also wanted to highlight that the software uh, development team has done a, a great work. Most of the control software is uh, in place and working uh, very well, as well as the hardware uh, the mechanics and the engineers have done a great job installing this and solving problems uh, during last year so that we have the instrument in working conditions now. This is showing an example of how you would call this in in Astrid to use the LASI. This is the uh, LASI display tab uh, showing like the results so that then the users can in principle uh, tell if uh, this is if they want to apply the solutions or not and uh, also a, a control panel that uh, gives you base, uh, an idea of what's going on. As you can see here, it, well, in this case, it wasn't working, but uh, if, if you were actively running a scan, it would tell you what's going on with the GPUs while you're doing the smoothing or uh, what, what step of the processing is taking place. So, since uh, the hardware and the software are in place, what we have been doing since then is uh, basically trying to understand what's the accuracy of the, of the instrument. Basically, how well can we measure these deformations and under which conditions can we measure them, right? Um, for example, one of the bas basic assumptions behind our, the method we're using is that the, the scanner is gonna remain fixed relative to the surface of the primary reflector during the, the scan, but as uh, as you can imagine, a thing as big as the GVD is going to move as soon as the wind uh, starts uh, uh, blowing. So uh, this assumption is not going to hold, and we want to basically quantify uh, how these uh, different effects are going to affect the, the accuracy of the instrument. Something I forgot to mention early on is that the, the sun itself does not seem to affect the accuracy of the measurements. As uh, and the the 
temperature, the absolute temperature also doesn't seem to play a role. It's only temperature gradients that affect the, the instrument. Um, sorry for that diversion. And just going back to the, the to what we have been doing during testing and commissioning, well, we have been basically uh, uh, using the scanner and the active surface to determine how well we can measure uh, the formation. So what we do is we use the active surface to deform the primary reflector in a way that we know. Then we scan this using the LASI and we try and we see if we can recover accurately the deformations we put in with the active surface. And we do this as a function of uh, different uh, uh, weather conditions to see when uh, uh, the, when we when the, the accuracy uh, decreases. So you won't want to use the LASI. Here on the bottom, I'm showing an example, a summary of some of the weather conditions. Uh, While well, we have been doing this, uh, the scans in particular, I'm showing the wind speed, the average wind speed during the scans themselves, and the uh, sorry, and the changes in the acceleration of the feed arm during the during the scans. And uh, what this is showing is basically we have scanned uh, when the wind speed is when the wind speed is very low, almost zero meters per second, all the way to six meters per second. And uh, for accelerations between uh, point, uh, po oh, 0 0.5, uh, ah, uh, 10 to the minus 4 uh, Gs, all the way to 3 times, times 10 to the minus 4 Gs. And these outliers you see out uh, up here are basically correspond to times when we were scanning and the elevator uh, of the feed arm was uh, working. Most of these scans have been taken during maintenance, so uh, there's other work taking place at, at on the telescope. But in general, these this kind of vibrations don't really, are, are very localized, so they don't really affect the, the measurements. Um, now, since we're, um, since we know what the deformations we put in are, and we are measuring them, we can compare them. Uh, and if we take the difference between these two things, what the active surface was doing and what the LASI measures, we can then estimate what the, res the uh, surface error is going to be based on these residuals. And that's what's shown here on the y-axis. We have this uh, epsilon, which represents the surface, so the, the wavefront error in the residuals between the input and measured values as a function of the wind speed, the variations in the wind speed, and variations in the acceleration. And <clears throat> as, a, as a quick uh, uh, number, Whenever this value is below uh, 100 microns, so down here, uh, that, that's a good result. If we're like up here, then uh, the, the accuracy is basically too low. Uh, I mean, we would be having a surface with a surface RMS of roughly 500 microns, which is uh, not good for high frequency observations. So the, the main takeaway from these figures is that uh, the LASI can do well when the wind speed is roughly two meters per second, maybe a bit below that. Um, but as long as the wind speed is below these values, uh, we can measure the, the formations with uh, an accuracy high enough that uh, we could we would be able to return the surface to a, a good uh, to a good state. If we look at individual deformations and how well we can measure them when the weather conditions are favorable, that means there's no fog, no snow on the dish, and the wind speed is below two meters per second, we get results like the ones shown here on the right, where we have on the y-axis uh, the values of the Cernicke polynomials uh, measured by LASI, and on the x-axis the values that were put into the active surface. And we see here that they there is they all uh, seem to lie on top of this red line, which is a one-to-one -one correlation. If we take the difference between y and x and use that as our new y, we see that all the values cluster around zero. And the scatter in these points, uh, the one sigma standard deviation is roughly plus minus 50 micrometers, which is uh, actually quite good uh, if we consider the capabilities of the active surface, which can uh, uh, position the actuators uh, with a repeatability of also plus minus 50 microns and with a precision of plus minus 25 microns. 
what does this mean? This means that even if we were able to, to reduce the scatter here, because the active surface uh, is, has already a repeatability of plus minus 50 microns, uh, that would not guarantee that we would uh, get a better surface error. Um, and if we look again at the at the contribution from each uh, from each one of these Cernicke polynomials to the total uh, wavefront error as a function of wind speed, uh, we get this figure where each point represents one measurement and the colors represent the variations in the wind speed during the during the scans themselves. <clears throat> and we notice that uh, whenever the wind speed is low, again, hopefully below two meters per second, and the points are light blue, so there are little variations in the wind speed, we can do, uh, we can measure these things accurately, as they are like close to zero. As soon as the wind speed begins to pick up and we get more variations, uh, larger variations in the in the wind speed, the differences become larger. So this, the the difference between what we measure and what was put in uh, gets larger, and we get uh, a larger scatter. And if we look at the different terms, uh, we see that some are more sensitive to the wind than others. For example, if we look at C7. Uh, for those of you which are familiar with the GVD and using autofocus holography, when I say C7 here, I'm not talking about uh, C7 as what you would put in for the active surface corrections, but the actual, just a single Cernicke polynomial. Um, we see that the, the points are much more closer to zero over a larger range of wind speeds than, for example, C5 or C6. Well, why do we think that's happening? Uh, C5, it's mainly because the uh, it's hard to measure because the term is very similar to what you would get if you uh, change the focus of the parabola. And uh, C6, uh, well, it's what we think is happening is that as soon as the wind begins to move a bit, the feed arm and the, relative, the scanner relative to the object being scanned, the surface of the primary reflector, the distance changes within a scan and we start uh, getting these uh, patterns on the difference maps because the way the these things are moving relative to each other is not the same during the signal and the reference scans. So we get these leftover uh, artifacts. And due to the way the scanner is mounted and just the way the, the telescope moves, the way these things show up tends to mimic very well a C6 polynomial uh, oblique astigmatism shown here on the bottom left. You can see we get these uh, red uh, regions across each other diagonal. That's very similar to what we get here. Uh, so that's why it's uh, kind of hard to measure C6. Uh, it's harder to measure C6 than uh, other terms. Um, so uh, when comparing with what the uh, with the, this wind limit to what uh, the, the to the wind conditions during your observation during high frequency observations, well, even though the DSS tries to schedule high frequency observations uh, only when the predicted wind speeds are going to be below 3.5 meters per second, uh, in some cases uh, we see that the wind speed uh, can be well above that those limits. Here what we're showing is uh, the measured wind speeds during Argus observations. Here the red uh, regions just show periods when the, when for this particular project uh, they were doing mapping observations. The white uh, segments represent the periods when they were doing calibration observations and the colors I honestly don't know. But um, this basically is just telling that it's just to show that the, the weatherman is not always correct. Uh, so that, that's something we uh, we need to look into in the going into the future of LASIK. Uh, as a fun fact, uh, LASIK can not only measure the formations, but it can also detect snow on the dish. Uh, this is one picture taken during the, well, a composite of many pictures taken with the camera on board of the terrestrial laser scanner. Uh, that's why you get all these many hexagons, and you can see the snow very well here on the far far edge of the dish, this is the vertex. And when you look at the data that comes out of the scanner, you can see that 
uh, basically you don't get a return for the points where, there, where you have snow, basically because snow is very good at scattering light. <clears throat> um, so uh, then the, the question I guess many of you have is, well, when can we use this? Uh, and unfortunately at this moment, we don't have a, uh, an answer. We're still looking into it, but uh, of course, as soon as we as this becomes available, we'll let everyone know. And again, uh, kudos to Paul Bostin for designing all these cool logos for the project. So short answer, uh, is that too much to ask for? Well, if you're an optical astronomer, maybe not, but for us that we're used to longer wavelengths, uh, it's it's been tough to to get the, these lasers uh, to, to behave the way we want. Um, just uh, looking into the future, I mentioned that there are systematics in the scanner. So one thing you might be wondering, well, can you calibrate these systematics? The answer is yes. Uh, uh, a group of uh, German researchers, which is heavily invested into the, the use of uh, laser, terrestrial laser scanners, developed this technique called uh, in-situ calibration, where you basically use the surface of the telescope as a as a calibration surface. And from this, you can work out the imperfections in the alignment of the optics of the scanner itself. And by using a, a model that incorporates all these uh, imperfections, you can then calibrate your, your scans, your point clouds to remove part of the systematic. So this is the same scan before applying the calibration, the same I showed before. And this is after you apply the calibration. So it does a pretty good job in reducing the systematics, but as you might notice, the the scale, it this is still not good enough to uh, basically be able to perform absolute measurements. Um, and uh, things are a bit more complicated than that because the calibration of the scanner, it's a function, a function of temperature. So in this work by Tomislav Medic, uh, he's showing one of the calibration parameters that describes the, the imperfections in the optics of the scanner as a function of temperature. And you can see that there's a clear trend with temperature. The, the nice, well, the, the, the good thing about this is that it's a very simple relation between temperature and, and the calibration parameter. So it should be relatively straightforward to calibrate or scanner as a function of temperature. And that's one of the things we need to do before handing over the instrument. So as a summary, the LASI uses this commercial of the shelf uh, terrestrial laser scanner to measure the formations of the uh, primary reflector of the GVT. The hardware and control software are in place, uh, thanks to a great job of the software uh, engineering and mechanics teams. Uh, we can measure, uh, well, the instrument can measure the formations accurately, uh, particularly when the wind speed is below uh, two meters per second. We're still trying to figure out how to incorporate this into operations and uh, we still well one thing that still needs to happen and will, it's likely to happen in the coming months it's uh, calibrating the the scanner as a function of temperature so that we can increase uh, the its range of operability and and when uh, and, and minimize the need uh, for using these reference scans for acquiring these reference scans so Thanks a lot for coming and for your attention. If there are any questions, I could try to answer them now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Pedro. Um, we do have two questions in the chat from Glenn uh, Langston, who just recently commented on them. Um, if you'd prefer me to read them out, I can. Otherwise, Glenn, you can ask them yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I've actually forgot what the difference is between the signal and the reference scan. I, I actually, so do, does the LASI effectively require the telescope to stop moving or stop tracking during those? Um, what, 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 mm -hmm. what parameter is changed? Do you have to change the surface or do you have to change? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And I apologize because I, I didn't explain it at all. So thanks for asking, Glenn. Um, yes, yeah, so for to, while the scanner is actively, uh, acquiring da data that that takes with the current settings we're using that's 50 seconds so for 50 seconds you really want the telescope to stay as still as possible so you cannot track you cannot change elevation you just have to keep it 
uh, still for 50 seconds. Once that finishes, you're free to, to move it again. Um, and in terms of uh, this reference and signal scan, well, for the purpose of the experiments I was showing here, uh, the reference scan is basically acquired when the, the actuators are at their zero levels. So whenever the staff determines, okay, like the, these are the zero levels for the actuators, we set them at that point. And if we scan the, the surface at that time, we call that a reference scan. And then for the signal scan, uh, or basically scanning the surface when there has been a deformation introduced to the surface through the active surface. Um, in terms of when uh, of measuring real deformations, the idea would be to obtain uh, the reference scans after using uh, out of focus holography to correct the surface to say 230 microns. So that then when you do a signal scan, since you're comparing to, the, to how the scanner saw the surface uh, after it, it was basically a perfect paraboloid, uh, the differences, if you subtract those difference, differences, the surface should go back to this uh, perfect paraboloid. All right, and we have uh, quite a few more questions put into the chat here um, from Rich Lacasse. If the corner cubes were reinstalled, would the accuracy of the Lassie uh, be improved? Or sorry, the, the TLS. Well, I, I, I'm not familiar with the corner cubes, actually. If, if Rick could uh, explain or someone. When the active surface and the, and the dish were originally put in, there were corner cubes at, at all the corners of the panels to reflect uh, the laser beams. So I was thinking that would give you better signal to noise on your TLS and possibly improve the accuracy. But they were all taken off when we, for, when we finally gave up on that system. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, good, a good question. Um, that would depend a bit on the on the reflecting properties of the of these cubes, because, for example, uh, if you notice here, there are all these little white dots on the on the scans on the point clouds. Um, those are the points where the panels have holes to see the the background retro reflectors, mm -hmm. and it turns out that uh, because of their reflecting properties, the the scanner actually performs worse. Uh, when, when you shoot at one of the retro reflectors. So uh, we would have to, to figure out if the if these corner cubes, uh, uh, yeah, if we get better uh, range of certainty with these corner cubes or not. And uh, just uh, as a more uh, general point, um, it would be useful to have, uh, I mean, in principle, it would be good to have reference points on the surface, but uh, it's hard because uh, everything is changing, uh, right? If it's mounted to the surface itself. So that's something that personally, I, I don't know how you would uh, kind of disentangle uh, changes in the in the surface itself and, and where the, how the positions of any reference points would change. So um, sort of connected to that, Pedro, I was wondering what are the larger holes uh, seen in those scans, uh, especially around the, the middle of the dish? Mm -hmm. Are those yeah, the, imperfections or? Um, these are uh, in general, well, I haven't done like a one-to-one -one comparison with the results from traditional holography, but uh, our guess is that these are uh, basically close to the center, you have, well, well the guess is that these are uh, defective actuators. So uh, when you move the panels, the, these panels are not moving uh, as much as they should. So then when you take the difference, you can get uh, uh, larger differences at those points. And uh, we're basically using like a distance-based threshold to, to clip some of the data. So those things get thrown out. Thanks. 
Um, all right, and then Pedro Biclini had asked uh, how LASI results compared with the holography. Uh, with traditional holography or out of focus holography? With both. Both? Uh, with uh, traditional holography, we haven't done a direct comparison. And because we have the, uh, the systematics, we can't really do absolute measurements. That's something you can do with, uh, with, holograph with traditional holography. So that's clearly a disadvantage for LASI. Uh, there have been uh, discussions about like, hey, yeah, uh, could we complement or even think about uh, replacing traditional holography? But that, for that, we really need uh, to investigate this further. Um, so, for example, he, uh, and in terms of the accuracy of the measurements, um, I uh, don't remember the exact value for traditional holography, but it's of the order of 100 microns, I think, uh, in terms of uh, uh, phase. And, uh, and with the scanner, once we average uh, many points together, we can reach an accuracy of uh, a comparable accuracy, at least close to the vertex of the of the dish. Further out, uh, we will be doing worse. So it's something we're investigating. And in terms of uh, against the out of uh, out of focus holography, we haven't done a, a sort of like a fair comparison where there's a, we're trying to measure the the same thermals using both methods. What we have done, though, it's uh, use out-of-focus holography to correct the surface and then uh, obtain a, a scan of the surface at that point in time. So when the surface is corrected, then we turn off these corrections and we measure it again. And, and, and we see that uh, if the weather is uh, behaving, uh, mainly the wind, we can measure the, the particularly the, the lower order cernic is uh, well. Okay, and then we did have a very interesting comment from Ron Madalena, who stated that um, we should expect to see differences between the measured and the forecasted wind speeds. Uh, apparently, the anemometer is improperly mounted uh, and not the correct height above the ground, um, as well as with calibration issues. So that's um, something interesting to keep in mind, I suppose. And I'm curious how that would um, affect the, the extent of the results that you find. Um, um, yeah, that, I mean, yeah, if it's miscalibrated, for sure, uh, the, I expect that the absolute values would shift one way or the other. Um, and Larry Morgan is actually doing a, a more in-depth investigation of how the the measured wind speeds compare with the predicted ones. I'm, I'm not going to comment on his work, but I just wanted to highlight that he has been doing a very thorough investigation of this predicted versus measured uh, wind speed uh, uh, situation. Oh, yeah, thanks for the comment, Ron. All right, and I think we have time for perhaps one more quick question, if anyone would like to ask Pedro. If not, then let's give a virtual round of applause to him. And thank you very much for sharing uh, this update with Lassi. It's really good to know how things are progressing. And uh, for those interested, next week we will have uh, Dr. Hannah Sizemore from the Planetary Science Institute. Uh, so take care, everyone. Uh, have a good weekend. And thank you so much, Pedro. Thank you. Bye, everyone.